Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Richard Arlen in U-Boat Prisoner. Each week we bring you news of better things for better living through chemistry. And often chemistry holds the gift of life itself. For instance, in X-ray film and screens, where chemistry converts invisible X-rays into visible images, enabling doctors to locate bullets or shrapnel in the body in a matter of seconds. X-ray screens and film are but two examples of how science and industry work together to save lives and bring better health to all. Tonight with Richard Arlen as Archie Gibbs, Ordinary Seaman, DuPont presents U-Boat Prisoner, the thrilling story of a merchant seaman rescued by the very submarine which had torpedoed his ship and killed his shipmates. Our play tonight was especially written for Cavalcade by Arthur Arendt and is based on the true story in Archie Gibbs' own book, U-Boat Prisoner, and stars Richard Arlen on the Cavalcade of America. This is the story of a man who was torpedoed twice on the same voyage. When his first ship was blown apart, he drifted on a raft in the Caribbean until they hauled him aboard another merchantman. Two hours later, it started all over again. First, there was just the sound of the men asleep in the forecastle and the careful throbbing of the ship's engines. Then the sudden bellow of the second officer on the bridge. Mark the time, men! We're going to get hit! Nine o'clock, shot, sir! Nine o'clock! And then, like the crack of Judgment Day, the torpedo. Another one, just to make sure. And then, the ship breaking in half and men spilling over into the sea. Yes, this is the story of a man who was torpedoed twice in one day. But that's not why we're telling it. Lots of seamen get it twice before they make port. But how many of them ever get picked up by a German submarine and spend the next four days as a prisoner on a U-boat? My name is Archie Gibbs. That's right, Archie. Kind of a fancy handle for a guy that grew up in an orphan asylum and learned what the world looks like from the deck of a cargo ship. Of course, I've done other things, too. Farm hand, dishwasher, railroad worker, pearl diver, and a couple of other odds and ends and et cetera. But the most fun I ever had out of life, and the most useful I've been to the human race, my country, was by way of taking a ship loaded with ammunition from one place to another, with a lot of ocean in between. The story begins at the National Maritime Union Hall in New York City. That's right. It was December, which is kind of a nice time of the year to be on dry land. Well, we were sitting around in the hiring hall, a bunch of us guys playing checkers and fighting the war with conversation. I tell you, this convoy set up is a bunk. Huh? One out of three, that's what we lose, and enough Navy protecting Your us. Y'all move, Joe. You ever make the run to Mermans? In the pig's eye, he did. Boy, them stukas. I hear you're good for 20 minutes if you get it up there. One minute more in that water and you're stiff as a mackerel. Let us be up, brothers. Attention, please. Attention. One A, B, and one ordinary wanted. Cargo ship going on a long voyage. One able-bodied and one ordinary seaman. Throw in your cards if you want it. One A, B, that's for me. Here you are. I'll take it. Here's my card. One ordinary right here. All right, hold everything, boys, while I look over your dates. December 2nd, November 19th, November 28th, November 12th. November 12th for the ordinary. Who can beat November 12th? I can, Mike. Let me see your card. This little pasteboard says I got back on my last trip November the 2nd. That gives me top priority. November 2nd's right. That does it. The job goes to Archie Gibbs. He told me the name of the scow and when she was sailing. I can't tell them to you, but she wasn't new and she wasn't fast. Oh, 
Not that that bothered me. Somebody's got to sail the slow ones, and up to then I've been pretty lucky. That's me knocking on wood. Anyhow, I had worked up a good, healthy case of hate against them Nazis, and it made me feel good. Yeah, hate your enemy, that's my motto. That way you get things done that gotta be done. Well, it was a few days later when we were out in the Caribbean, part of a big convoy, that things began to happen. Boy, this is the life. Hey, we just sighted another empty raft and some wreckage. Yeah. It must have been hit so hard a refrigerator busted open. There was potatoes and oranges and quarters of beef all floating by. Could almost stick out your hand and grab one. Why didn't, Jays? Because there was other things, too. Bodies. Three of them face down in the water. That's why I didn't stick out my hand, Archie. I got a feeling we're going to get it tonight. Shut up, Irish. I got a feeling we're going to catch ourselves a nice big tin fish. Shut up, he said. Anyhow, we're too near Trinidad. So is the one that got it that them bodies were on. Only they weren't bodies then. They were alive, walking and talking like we are now. Will you shut up? We're going to get it today, Archie. I got a feeling about these things. You want to bet, Irish? Would you care to risk a couple of bucks? Lay it even money, we get it in 24 hours. Only take a risk. Not in the way you guys think, anyhow. The only risk is whether I'll be alive to collect. Exactly three hours and 20 minutes later, I was in the Caribbean Sea looking around for something to hang on to. Out of nowhere, there had been a crash like something you never heard in your life. A blinding flash of light and ship shaking like a big hand had got hold of it and squeezed it. The next thing you knew, there were heads bobbing around the water, yours and others. What happened to Irish? Well, that torpedo exploded in the engine room. Irish was in there at the time, making a little bet with the chief engineer. I was picked up by another ship in the convoy. They gave me some dry clothes and I went below. It seemed like I had just shut my eyes when the whole crazy merry-go-round started all over again. First off, it was quiet there in the focus room. All you could hear was the sound of men breathing in their sleep. And the careful, quiet throbbing of the ship's engine. And then the sudden hollering of the second officer on the bridge. Mark the time, men! The ship's getting hit! Nine o'clock sharp, sir! Nine o'clock! And then, like the crack of judgment day... The torpedo. One more, just to make sure. And pretty soon, I was back in the Caribbean again. Somewhere, as I don't remember, I picked up a flashlight. I turned it on, and there I saw heads bobbing around the water again. Then I saw something else. It was a shadow that came up under my feet, like one of those platform elevators that come out of a sidewalk. And before I knew what hit me, I was rolling around on the forward deck of a German submarine. All right, come along. Come along, get up. And hold on to the rail or you'll be washed overboard. Okay. Yeah, here yeah, now. You know what this is? Yeah, it's a revolver. Looks like a 38. Good. Then you will answer my questions. You're a Navy man, no? No. It's not healthy to lie when I ask questions. I'm not lying. I was an ordinary seaman in that tub you torpedoed last night. Last night, huh? <laughs> You're a little sorry you told me that. What was the name of the ship I just sank? I wasn't aboard long enough to, to find out. What was the name of your own ship? Answer me. The North Arrow? Good. Where was she from? New York. And where was she going? I don't know. The Navy Department never confided in me. What kind of cargo? Empty... I said, what kind of cargo? Empty drums. Em... What are you saying? Empty drums do not explode? Was she a warship or a merchantman? A merchantman. And a pretty old one at that. You lie. I never seen such an old scow. Couldn't figure out what kept her afloat. Schweinhund! You go down now. You mean, uh... Down there? Yeah. There's a man there who wishes to speak with you. Oh, 
No, I don't want you going off on the wrong tack about me. I'm no hero, see? Even if the previous conversation sounded kind of fancy for a guy who was a U-broke prisoner, the truth is I expected to be shot, so what did I have to lose? If I told them what they wanted to know, what would it get me? Nothing but a funny feeling when St. Peter inquired if I was a good guy or what did I ever do for my country. I was thinking about these things and making up my mind how I'd act as we climbed down the control room ladder. Down below, the second in command, a big, tall, blonde guy, looked me over. And when he talked, it was with uh, what they call a Knoxford accent. Come over here, you. Where are your papers? In my safety bag. You got it there in your hand. Sir. Sir. This is very good, this bag. Yeah. Sir. Uh, who makes it? Norwegian. His name is Count Mourner. Uh-huh. He's one of the guys you didn't get when you walked in there. Sir. Thank you. He also invented a life-saving suit. And on account of it, a whole lot of American seamen are alive today. That is enough. Well, I just thought you'd like to know, sir. You are very intelligent for a sailor. Uh, later on, we will see just how intelligent you are uh, with political officers. After the second officer left, I had a look around. I figured this U-boat must have been at sea for quite a while. The torpedo cradles along the bulkhead were empty, and the floor plates bare. Up forward, there were four torpedo tubes, but they were locked, and I couldn't tell whether they were loaded or not. I sat down on one of the bunks. Four sailors stopped playing cards and stared at me like I was something special. Nobody said a word. I guess maybe I was a little nervous. So I was just looking around for something to grab if they started getting rough when... One of them finally broke the ice, and he said... Uh, San Francisco is very beautiful. I like very much San Francisco. Glad to hear it, mister. I got kind of a soft spot for San Francisco myself. Charleston, South Carolina is very beautiful. I like very much Charleston, South Carolina. Sorry, mister. Never been there. Uh, I go to Valparaiso, to San Francisco, Yokohama. Hmm. Seventeen trips. San Francisco is very beautiful. Nice people. Ha! <laughs> Yokohama is no good. Oh, that's swell. Then when we get through with it, it won't be much of a loss. Ah, the Japans is no good people. America win from Japan quickly. But I'd not like to see America fight Germany. Uh, Maybe you tell me, why America make fight on Germany? Yeah, 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 why? Why? On account of a guy named Hitler, your boss. Also, if I remember correctly, you declared war on us December the 8th, right after Pearl Harbor. But das ist nicht wahr. The, the German newspapers say America declare war first on the Germans. Oh, huh? yeah. America declare war on us. Can you top that? These guys really believed what they read in their newspapers. Oh, I tried to convince them, but it wasn't any use. They just smiled like maybe I was a little bug house. And then one of them brought over a book. Acting kind of pleased and proud, he turned the pages so I could see the pictures. Very interesting. Very pretty pictures, no? Yeah, only I saw them before. You have seen these pictures? Sure, in a movie about your guys in Poland. It was called, uh, Victory in the East. Yeah, Sik i Mostan. Yeah, that's it. Oh, dear. Did they show this in America? Certainly they showed it in America. You can also get a copy of Mein Kampf in any bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> you, make, you make a joke, no? No. In America, you can read anything and say anything you like. We figure it's a good idea to listen to what the other guy's got to say so we'll know how wrong he is. That's democracy. You had better not speak like this. Then you see him. Him? Who? A Leutnant Zimmer. Uh, he is our political officer. He, he will ask you questions. It is best for you that you speak uh, what do you say? Uh, soft to Leutnant Zimmer. Eh, Carl? Yeah. Soft. Very soft. Mm-hmm. 
You are listening to Richard Arlen on the Cavalcade of America in U-Boat Prisoner, an exciting story of heroism at sea presented by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Richard Arlen plays the role of Archie Gibbs, American merchant seaman who was torpedoed, rescued, torpedoed again, and picked up by a German submarine. Station with the German sailors, Gibbs has learned of the existence of a mysterious political officer on board, who, as our play continues, is shortly to question Gibbs. Well, a couple of days went by, and pretty soon I lost track of time. I was treated fairly well by the men, but just the same I was worried. It was this Lieutenant Zimmer guy, the political officer. You see, by this time, I wasn't so sure they were going to shoot me. What I mean is, I had hopes. And this Zimmer not sending for me or anything worried me. What was he waiting for? What did he want to know? Suppose he offered to set me free and give me a raft and some grub if I answered some questions. Questions like what was the naval installation at Trinidad and things like that. What should I do? Tell him to go jump in the lake or play along and try to bluff it. And if I did, could I get away with it? Well, it got more and more complicated in my head until I finally decided to quit worrying. And sort of smell things out as I went along. And then one afternoon, something funny happened. I was asleep. And all of a sudden, I heard a familiar noise. It was dark in the wardroom, but I finally made out somebody standing by a wireless. It was one of the sailors, the big guy they called Carl. He looked around quick like he was being careful about something, and then he twisted the dial. Nine, Carl, nine. That is not the one. Here, turn it some more, Carl. Uh, turn it some more. What were they looking for? Maybe a secret sending station in South America. Maybe instructions about refueling or attacking a new convoy. Maybe I was going to be the only American ever listened to a secret message coming in from the high command all the way over there in Berlin. I got so choked up I stopped breathing. And suddenly, Carl whispered, Yeah, yeah, I have it. It is coming in now. And then as he tuned up the volume, I heard it. Well, you could have knocked me over with a pincushion. <laughs> yeah, 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 good, good. Uh, Shane, huh, Shane? The deep in the heart of Texas. Uh, sing, sing, Americana, sing. Punishment, you will report for extra duty. You will come with me. Okay, sir. Go in. Yes, sir. I will now leave you to the friendly ministrations of our political officer, uh, Lieutenant Zimmer. Hi, little up. Hello. Sit down. Thanks. You speak German? No. Gibbs is a German name. Not since William the Conqueror, it ain't. My parents and grandparents were born in America. And one of my grandfathers was an American Indian. Mm, savage. Ah, interesting. Did your ship come through the Yucatan Straits? I can't tell. I'm not a navigator. Answer. Okay. Before Pearl Harbor, we used the Straits because we didn't want any trouble with you Nazis. Now we don't use them, and we're looking for it. Mm. These photographs I found in your bag, they are your children? They're my sister's kids. Mm-hmm. Very healthy looking. In Germany, we are not so healthy. We are pleased to hear that. Hmm? 
Answer. Why, I haven't thought about it. Perhaps one day the shoe will be on the other foot. Hmm? Maybe. This is your club card? My union card. Tell me, can your club force you to go back to see, to, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, sign on again if you do not wish? I uh, ask only out of curiosity. It ain't a club, it's a union, a trade union. I ask again, your club will not make you go back to see? My union? Okay, my club cannot force me to do anything I do not wish. In America, I do not have to do anything I do not wish. The United States government does not make men go to sea if they do not wish. Sir, it is better that you do not go to sea again. Oh, does that uh, mean you're going to let me go? Yes, on one condition. Oh. You wish to hear this condition? Sure, what have I got to lose? <laughs> that is very sensible. How many American destroyers at Trinidad? How do I know? You've been there? Yeah, but I never counted them. Make an estimate. Okay. 200. 200? <coughs> we will go on to the question of bombing planes. How many? Uh, how many uh, bombers at Trinidad? Uh, two motor or four motor? I am being very patient, Mr. Gibbs. What's that? Depth charges. One of your destroyers, no doubt. One of the 200. Now, Mr. Gibbs, about those bombing planes, how many... Kind of close, wasn't it? You know what this is? Say, will you tell me something? Why do you Nazis always stick a gun under a guy's nose and ask him if he knows what it is? Of course I know what it is. It's a gun. It would be wise to answer my questions. Look, Lieutenant, ain't you being kind of silly? How would I know how many bombs... Hey, that was real close. For the last time, Mr. Gibbs, how many bombing planes are based on Trinidad? And for the last time, I'm telling you, I don't know. All I know is there's at least one of them, because the thing you think is a destroyer is a bomber, and the next egg it lays is going to be right on our head. That's exactly where it was, right on our head. I was blown to the surface with a couple of other guys. And then an American Corvette picked me up and landed me in a certain place in South America. What happened to Herr Lieutenant Zimmer and the rest of the baby killers, I never found out. And I ain't particularly worried. Well, when I finally got back to New York, they gave me a medal and they took my picture. I made a little speech over the radio. In it, I mentioned how it felt to be torpedoed and what it was like inside of a German submarine. I also mentioned how important it was for our soldiers to receive the stuff our ships carried to them, and that every nickel invested in war bonds would build a ship or a gun or a plane that maybe one day would kill a Jap or sink a U-boat like the one I was on, which is a very good idea indeed. A very good idea indeed. But there's one little incident Archie Gibbs neglected to mention. It took place just a few weeks after he landed in New York from his adventure with that U-boat. The scene is again the Seaman's Hiring Hall in New York City. Attention, please, attention. One ordinary wanted. Cargo ship going on a long voyage. One ordinary. Throw in your cards if you want it. Okay, yes, ma'am. I'll yep. take it. Okay, okay. Hold everything, boys, while I look over your dates. April 12th, May 2nd, April 24th, April 9th. Who can beat April 9th? I can, Mike. Read it and wait. That does it. April 7th. The job goes to Archie Gibbs. <laughs> Thank you, Richard Arlen. In reenacting U-Boat Prisoner, DuPont is proud to join all Americans in saluting the gallant men who sailed the seven seas, delivering the materials of war to our armed forces. Mr. Arlen will return to the microphone in a few minutes. 
Meanwhile, here is Clayton Collier with a story from DuPont. A technical problem that has bothered mankind for all the years of recorded history, and probably bothered our caveman ancestors before that, is how to make things stick to other things. From the Egyptians down to the present day, people have tried just about everything, from egg whites to fish glue as cement and glue. Modern chemical research now provides adhesives of entirely new compositions, and they are accomplishing important wartime jobs. Polyvinyl resins, for instance. Polyvinyl resins are chemical derivatives of acetylene, the same gas that used to light old-time bicycle and automobile lamps. These resins provide a whole new series of adhesives. One bonds wood to metal so tightly that the wood actually splits and tears apart before the adhesive gives way. Other polyvinyls replace natural latex in rubber cement. There are polyvinyl adhesives for metal, leather, wood, cork, ceramics, and paper. Another resin adhesive manufactured by DuPont, a white powder soluble in water, has no odor, cannot harm foodstuffs, does not corrode metal, and for all practical purposes is weatherproof. Right now it is used in making paperboard and fiberboard containers for the armed forces. Boxes made with it have to pass a test. They must stand being anchored in the surf for 24 hours. That gives you some idea of the rough treatment these new adhesives will take. DuPont manufactures still other adhesives of an entirely different type, synthetic elastic compositions. Some of these can be vulcanized like rubber. Some vulcanize themselves slowly with ordinary exposure. One of these is fairprene cement, which is especially designed to resist oils and greases. Another protects against corrosion. Each cement has its own special properties. Last, but by no means least, the little tube of Duco cement that has been a familiar friend and helper in your home for years now serves in the wartime manufacture of radio and telephone coils, signal lights, and electrical fuses, among other things. Duco cement is still available to you. And when the war is won, all of these adhesives, which are now giving splendid wartime service, will serve industry and you as DuPont better things for better living through chemistry. And now, here is Richard Arlen, star of tonight's Cavalcade. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Archie Gibbs of the Merchant Marine, the hero of tonight's play, was not a character of fiction, but a real man. In the fullest meaning of the word, the men of the Merchant Marine are real men, often serving their country under conditions of danger and hardship not exceeded in any branch of the armed forces. America is very proud of its valiant men who go down to the sea in ships, the men of the Merchant Marine. With Alfred Drake, star of Broadway's greatest hit, Oklahoma, and Jackie Kelk, popular young radio star... Cavalcade next week presents Bullseye for Sandy, an exciting story of our Navy's submarine chaser service. The story of PC-627, the little boat that fired the first shot in the invasion of Sicily on July 10th. Again next Monday, DuPont invites you to join the Cavalcade audience when we'll present Alfred Drake and Jackie Kelk in an exciting drama of a little-known branch of the Navy, the submarine chasers that played such a vital role in the invasion of Sicily six months ago. The orchestra and musical score tonight were under the direction of Donald Voorhees. Cavalcade is pleased to remind its listeners that Richard Arlen's next picture is the Paramount production Minesweeper. This is Carl Frank sending best wishes from Cavalcade sponsor... The DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is the National Broadcasting Company.